States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Those of you who have 
phones, um, photos are not on, on, on phones. Those of you who have phones, which I suspect is almost all of you, please ensure they're on silent or preferably turned off. And if they are on buzz, make sure they're in a pocket and not sitting on the surface where they will buzz and rattle. So appreciate that. Dignitary list. We always go over the dignitaries because we have people who have sacrificed a lot and have done a lot for not only Toastmasters, <coughs> but for, <laughs> for our districts, our divisions, our areas, and for each one of us as members. Without leaders, we would not have clubs. Without clubs, we wouldn't have leaders. So we all work together. And we want to recognize those people who selflessly gave up time for the humongous salary of zero. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of work. I'm going to start by listing out the dignitaries, and at the end I will announce if there's anybody who's not on this list, please raise your hand. Let's please welcome our current Program Quality Director, DTM Abel Acha. days ago and he was here and why did I wish you feel welcome to the ball. Can't really tell us something going on here. Uh, our Northwest Area, our Northwest Division A Area Director, um, Division Director, Rose Schultz. Rose Schultz. Where <laughs> Division A is our division. That's the division that our area falls under. Let's go to our area directors. Area one current area director, Joan Walton. <laughs> and she did this too. And for those of you who know Joan, isn't this so Joan? <laughs> this is so Joan. As soon as I walked in the door, I knew it. Yeah. Area two director, Jill Lukovich. Yes. Sam Siegel, Sean Siegel. Nice to see you. Area 4 Director, Rick Westcott. Area 5 Director, Kirsten Jensen. And Area 6 Director, Mary Matan, Matran, did I say that correctly? Matran. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have past district governors here at our little area contest. That's how much talent we have in this area. Please help me welcome uh, past district governor, D. Campus Burrow. Thank you. And for those of you who are new to Toastmasters, you'll notice we call them district governors and not district directors. That's because the title has recently changed within the last two years. Who's ready for a contest? Yes. We're going to have two contests tonight. Here a speech contest and a speech evaluation contest. The speech evaluation contest will be first. When that contest has concluded, we'll have at least a 10-minute break. After the break, we will conduct the humorous speech contest. The chief judge has briefed the contestants' time of the ballot count of sergeant arms. They've all been briefed by the chief judge and the contest chair prior to the beginning of this contest. Everyone's aware of the Toastmaster International rules that govern this contest. No one should enter or leave the room during the minute of silence between the presentations. Or during the <coughs> Thank you. With that said, let the contest begin. <coughs> and programs, I will give a speaking order for the evaluation contest. And I'll give you plenty of time to write it down and I'll give you spellings of the down. Contestant number one, Jennifer McAllister. Contestant number one, Jennifer McAllister. The name is up here and in the programs. Does anyone need me to spell it out if you can't see the program well? Okay. 
Contestant number two, Ann Krause. Contestant number two, Ann Krause. Ann is not in the program. She is last minute filling, so I will give you the spelling of her name. It's A N N E K R A U S E. A N N E K R A U S E. Contestant number three, Kathy Biederstadt. Contestant number three, Kathy Biederstadt. Contestant number four, Brian Staller. Contestant number four, Brian Staller. Does anyone need more time to write these down? All right, in order for our evaluation <coughs> contestants to compete, we need someone to speak for them. Please help me welcome to the lectern target speaker, Danny Bobrow. This expedition called life. This expedition called life. Danny Bobrow. Thank you, Madam Contest Chair. I'm glad I'm not judging because I might be biased. Uh, four years ago, I climbed a mountain called Beerstadt. <laughs> In 1994, I began a hobby as a mountaineer. In the intervening 20 years or so, I have learned a few things, and I've actually gleaned them into what I call six success criteria, which have not only served me in achieving my summits, maybe a little bit more successfully and consistently, but they've also informed me back here in civilization in both my personal and business life. And my hope for you is that you will draw some inspiration from them as well. Confidence is simply belief in oneself. Sometimes we look at people and think that they're just born with confidence. I'm not so sure that that's true. Consider that even the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, acknowledged later in his career that he said he was the greatest well before he knew he was. So even the greatest wasn't above faking it until you make it. Confidence can also come from without. I think a really good example of this is JFK, who in 1961 stated, we choose to go to the moon. At that time, the United States, that is NASA, had under its collective belt a grand total of 15 minutes of experience in space. And that was all suborbital. Gene Krantz, who was the flight director of NASA, said that when he heard that speech, he thought JFK was out of his mind. He wasn't out of his mind, he was just thinking outside of the box. I think that's a good lesson for all of us, though, that confidence can come from other people, people who believe in us sometimes more than we believe in ourselves. We can probably all relate to situations like that. Often it's our parents, our teachers, our clergy, and I think we also do well to consider that there may be people in our lives today that could use a pat on the back, who could use maybe a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of more belief in them that they have in themselves. The second success criterion that I've identified is purpose. You see, when a person's basic needs are met, including their monetary needs, most people need something to strive for, a cause that's bigger than themselves, and not even merely bigger than themselves, but actually bigger than the group of which they're a part. I personally have been privileged to be part of the founding of two organizations that have helped me pursue a purpose that's bigger than myself. The first is the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. That organization has as its purpose educating not just health professionals but the lay public about the links between oral and overall health, the increasing increasingly growing mounting body of evidence that shows that the health of the mouth is related to the health of the body. I've also been involved, and this is another example of being able to relate my passions with my purpose, in founding Climb for a Cause. Since 1992, Climb for a Cause has funded, supported, and in various ways uh, contributed to the success of oral health education and treatment projects, a total of 70 uh, at last count, 
we've delivered first-time care to over 50,000 children with equivalent dental care of over $10 million. The third success criterion is a healthy relationship with perfectionism. In this country, we tend to view perfectionism as a virtue, when in fact, I think it's a vice. The reason is that if you think about what perfectionism means, it means a dissatisfaction with anything other than perfection. It's a, uh, it's a laudable goal, but the unfortunate effect is that it tends to demotivate and frustrate not only you, but people around you. It tends to do what's called living in the gap. And as a mountaineer, I never like to fall into any gap. <laughs> the gap is the distance between where you are and where you want to be. People tend to look forward with frustration rather than giving themselves a pat on the back for how far they've come. And this just raises the point that I'm not discouraging anybody from having big, hairy, audacious goals. <laughs> all right? But I do want you to realize that there, while there may be no unrealistic goals, there are unrealistic deadlines. We want to be cognizant of that. The next criterion is a healthy relationship with failure. A Chinese proverb holds that failure is not falling down. Failure is falling down and refusing to get back up. I've actually found failure to be the best teacher. I've learned a lot of lessons in the mountains. Nothing typically goes the way you expect it to, not completely. So it's a great teacher. It's also kind of, I liken it to a spice, which makes success when you finally achieve it that much sweeter. I can tell you from direct experience that that's the case. The next criterion is teamwork. Someone once said, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. I've actually had personal challenges with teamwork. I think this is because of my eyesight. I was born with a, with a form of macular degeneration, which uh, left me blind in my left eye and low sighted in the right. Consequently, I really couldn't engage in team sports because all team sports pretty much involve some kind of a projectile. And when you're have no depth perception. It's uh, kind of an exercise in frustration. Uh, at this point, some of you may be wondering, well, how does this guy climb mountains if he's so blind? And the answer is one word, teamwork. All right, I've got other people helping me find the route. The final success criterion is persistence. That's something I know something about, but I didn't always. I actually learned about it from my high school gym teacher who taught me the concept of the psychological fatigue barrier, which holds quite simply that the mind gives up way before the body needs to. And I really, for some reason, that hit me at that time, because within two weeks, I set the school record for the most sit-ups in two minutes. I just kept pushing through the pain. Now, persistence is a force. And like any force, it can be used for good or evil. I was reminded of this recently by an email that my college roommate sent to me, which says, and I quote, my girlfriend thinks I'm a stalker. Well, she's not my girlfriend. Not yet. <laughs> but the fuel that drives all those success criteria is attitude. Attitude is absolutely necessary. Without it, you can't support other people. There's no sense of purpose. There's no confidence. There's no persistence. You just got nothing. It's all about what's in your mind. Each of us is on our own expedition, an expedition called life. It is an epic journey on an uncharted course. My wish for you is that you confidently and purposefully persist and that you reach your summit swiftly and safely, whatever it may be.
While the evaluation contestants complete their evaluations, we're going to get to know the target speaker. I'm going to ask Danny to come back up here, please. Actually, that's not entirely uh, in jest. Uh, when I climbed Mount McKinley in 1996, I climbed with the, uh, the only female bush pilot. And uh, I asked her, I said, have you ever considered climbing? And she said, no. And I said, well, why? She said, well, first, I see what, when, I, when I'm, because you fly onto the glacier there. And she says, well, I see what these people are climbing over, because it's all latticework of crevasses, and it looks pretty gnarly. <coughs> but when you're down there, you can't see it. So it's, you know, but anyway, she said, that's number one. She said, number two, I've never seen a group of people more anxious to get off one place to get somewhere else. And, and, and I could see where that would be logical. But at the other side, I mean, if you go through life on a flat line versus people that deliberately deprive themselves of things, which one do you think appreciates the finer things in life when they don't have them all the time? So I can't wait to get into the mountains, and eventually I can't wait to get out of the mountains. But it doesn't mean that I'm always suffering. I think the food tastes a lot better, the beer tastes a lot better when I come back. <laughs> wow, I never thought about that. And then there's the views and the challenge and the camaraderie. And it's a skill. I mean, it, there's a lot of, to it. But mostly it's attitude, I thought. Is, it, is there a mountain climbing community? Because most of the things that we become intensely interested in, you find these niches of people that communities. Is there a community message boards? Or There's a Chicago together? Mountaineering Club, as a matter of fact. Really? I was its president uh, until about 10 years ago, and I often tell people, while there are no mountains in Chicago, there are mountaineers. <laughs> it's just that my backyard is over here. Wow. Although rock climbing, some of the best uh, rock climbing in the Midwest is in Devil's Lake, which is just north of Madison. Wow, very interesting. And do you mind if I ask you, is this an expensive sport to pursue? It seems like it would be. People are a lot of times surprised at sports that are not in the mainstream, how much they cost to pursue. It can be costly. There's an initial investment, and then if you get good at it and you don't need to retain the services of a guide, or if you go with cheap guides like I do sometimes, <laughs> uh, you get what you pay for. But I'm used to a Spartan kind of existence in the mountains. I'll be leaving for Nepal in two weeks. 
in three weeks. And when I'm paying to, to climb for four weeks, and I'll be climbing a mountain just 10 miles south of Mount Everest, uh, I'm paying, but I, I need a private guide to go with me for my eyesight and because uh, my issues with the climatization. I'm going to spend about $10,000. But to climb Mount Everest, the typical expedition up the South Call is about $65,000. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. And you so thought you it was expensive. I have no idea. I mean, we read about it, but you don't But that know. said, you can, you can go with, again, you can go to a guide and climb Mount Rainier for $1,000, <laughs> or you can do it yourself for 50 bucks. And I'll just get on that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Try Mount Trash Mount Everest. I really. <laughs> sure, so, slow. I really like the quote because on the bio sheets, for those who've been in the contest, well, the last question is, what's your favorite quote? And I'm an English hound and grammar nerd, and I really like the quotes. This one particularly interests me. It's by Ben Franklin. Do well by doing good. And I'm always a stickler for the difference between well and good, so I just wanted to point out that that was very well thought out. Well, thank you. I thank good. you for coming up here and speaking. We normally have a certificate for you, which Linda will have for you. And what I'm going to do is bring you back up at the end of the which contest. Which one's Linda? Linda. I'm going to her. The okay. other one, right. I'm going to bring you back up at the end of the contest when we interview the contestants. I'll bring you back up with them so that I can present your certificate in front of everyone. It's a deal. Thank you. You're We are right now ready to hear from our evaluation contestants. <coughs> we will start immediately with the first contestant, and there will be one minute of silence exactly between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up during in between time. After all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. We are now ready to begin the evaluation contest. Contestant number one, Jennifer McAllister. Contestant number one, Jennifer McAllister. Thank you, Madam. Contest chairwoman, fellow Toastmasters, most welcome guests and dignitaries, and especially Danny. First, I must say, I am honored to be your evaluator, and I thank you for coming forward, especially before this very tough crowd. I appreciate that you probably already have a CC, maybe beyond, and my understanding is that the, the target speakers are to be beginner speakers. But in my opinion, you surpassed that. So maybe I'm guessing, but I think you did a very good job. I want to go through your speech and as best I can, give some highlights of what I think you did very well and some suggestions on how to make it even better. First, I like that you had the title of your speech, This Expedition Called Life. It set the tone, it told us what your speech was about. Partly, kept me guessing, but I had a sense of it. It also made it relevant to us, life. It's a pretty general open topic. But then when you came up, you didn't have notes, you came to the side, and there you were. You were before the audience, but there you were. A little bit tight on the lecture. But fortunately, then you came from that, and you used your body in ways that helped make your points. You didn't use your body with a lot of superfluous gestures. You didn't move all over the place, like just you didn't know where to be. You were purposeful in your body gestures. I appreciate that. I also liked how in your introduction, you made a point of articulating the purpose of your speech, being to talk about overcoming adversity. I always like to know up front, what are you going to talk about? I think you could have improved it a bit by telling us even more of what you were going to say, perhaps by itemizing all of the different factors. It would have let me in on your speech that much more. But then when you did proceed through the speech, I liked how you went A, B, C, one, two, three, as far as the different factors of importance. And when you did so, you gave your personal examples. I always love personal stories. They, they help 
connect the audience so much more, and that connected to me when you talked about your own examples. However, I would have liked to have heard a lot more in the way of your vocal variety, your facial expressions, and even hear more body gestures to liven up those examples so I could really feel that you were living what you were telling us. Painting pictures through your verb choices, adjectives, would have really helped those stories come alive even more. You had a lot of great material. I would have liked to have seen it get used even more fully. And then you noted that those factors could be voiced up with the attitude, and you made your speech that much more relevant with your conclusion by talking about this expedition called life and how you hope that each of us use those factors. So all in all, I think your speech was very appropriate to our audience, very timely, and very impressive. Thank you, Dan. Ann Krause, contestant number two. Contestant number two, Ann Krause. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, dignitaries, and especially Danny. <laughs> that was a really informative speech. I got so much out of it, and I thought there was a lot of content. What I'd like to do is split it into two, to critique the, the content first and then the technique. There was so much content, and it was all so valuable. And yet, I felt that maybe if it had been a little less examples, it would have been easier to absorb because there was so much information given. And it was every single little point that you made was so valuable. You know, I would want to walk away with as much as I can. And sometimes, personally, I go on overload. So maybe not other people have that issue. but. Um, sometimes I do, so I would appreciate that, you know, it maybe be brought down a little bit. And also, you started out by mentioning the mountaineering, and I thought that was really interesting. So I would have thought it would have been more tied in if some of your personal examples had to do with the mountains. That's kind of what I was originally primed for. So that takes care of the content part. And then as far as the technique, it was a little bit fast. And again, maybe it's me and the fact that I'm getting older and you know <laughs> hearing and all these things. But I don't seem to take in information that quickly anymore. So if, if the delivery is a little bit slower, it helps me as an audience member being able to listen a little bit better and take it all in. So those are the two things that I really 
you know, wanted to talk about. Again, I think there's so much in that speech, and I, I would love to see you, Danny, take it up into another notch and just roll with it because there is, there's a lot of good value there and there's a lot to work with and it would be really good to, for, you know, even sh show high school kids or some other people, you know, there's so many different groups that could benefit from all the experiences that you've been through. So thank you a lot, Danny. Contestant number three, Kathy Biederstadt. Contestant number three, Kathy Biederstadt. Toastmasters that stick with me tend to be those to which I most relate. And I caught myself on several incidences during your talk going back to an emotion that I felt the way I imagine you felt while you were relating your story. I think I look around this audience and I'm thinking it's a great talk. It's a wonderful message to say, in order to have self-esteem, we all need to do esteemable things. But you're preaching to the choir because we're all here already. <laughs> but it's a great reminder to hear that it's a slippery slope when we compare our insides to someone else's outsides. We never know how someone else is feeling. We only know what we see. And that was a very good reminder. I loved your talk. You had a strong message and you used strong, bold vocabulary to deliver it. I think you really got your point across in a positive, happy, uplifting way. I don't know if this is a talk that you give on occasion, if you've ever given it before. Maybe it's your pocket speech that you keep boxed up and you pull it out for occasions such as this. I don't know. But I think it's a great talk. This could even be what I would consider a Ronco speech, since it could be so easily sliced and diced and presented for many happy occasions. So I hope to hear it again, maybe in this format, maybe in another. Thank you.
Brian Steller, contestant number four. Contestant number four, Brian Steller. Hello, Toastmasters. Welcome, dignitaries. Welcome, guests. And especially Danny. Where's Danny? He's over there. Wonderful job. Wonderful speech. Very good. That was excellent. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to that speech. I imagine everyone else in here did as well. Danny, what I would like to do here is tell you what I liked a lot about your speech and then tell you a couple things that perhaps you could approve upon, which obviously is a very difficult task for a fellow like this who has accomplished so much and has done such a wonderful job here this evening. But since this is an evaluation, I'm going to give it a stab and hopefully show you something that uh, my predecessors did not. <coughs> so uh, let's see here. Danny, what I really liked about your speech was the, the, the purpose of it, the overall message. Very uplifting. We don't hear a whole lot of uplifting speeches, maybe not as many as we should. And I thought yours was stupendously uplifting. What do we have in here? We had confidence, purpose, healthy relationship with perfection, healthy relationship with failure, teamwork, and persistence. I really liked the word healthy that you used there. I thought that was the most helpful word you could have possibly used in your speech because perfection and failure are all right in doses, of course. We learn from them. We strive for them. But it needs to be healthy. And I think that you really did a fantastic job enumerating that point for us all. I uh, also liked the uh, stories that you wove into your points. It became very autobiographical in nature, talking about the different organizations that you're involved with, the fact that you had, and still have, I imagine, macular uh, degeneration. I really loved how you put that into the teamwork part of your speech and immediately followed up with persistence. Had macular degeneration, couldn't do team sports, so I did a whole lot of sit-ups. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. I like that. Now, Danny, I think you could improve on a couple of things here. I think that I got a little lost when you brought in the attitude theme. It, it seemed like that was the, the one ring to bind them all type of uh, setup almost. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I can't disagree with the attitude part of it, but I think that attitude could have been maybe one of the main points, or maybe you could have done seven points in there instead of six. I, I don't know. I just I got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then all of a sudden, now we got this attitude thing. I also would have really liked it if you could have told us a little bit more experience actually climbing mountains. You know, we got in here, and I was like, oh man, this guy's climbing mountains, this is going to be awesome. We're going to learn about, you know, yachties and abominable snowmen, all this wonderful stuff. But I didn't really hear anything about mountains. Um, I mean, probably good you didn't have any experience in, in the failure category from mountain climbing, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, I suppose. Um, I, 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 would have, I would have liked to see that. Also, you know, you're, you're leaning on this thing a lot. You know, for a story about mountain climbing, you know, get up there. You know, climb the mountains. Let's see it. Thank you again for your help and teaching us. And everybody, reach your summits. <laughs>
Madam Toastmaster, we have collected all the ballots. All right. Thank you. Wasn't it a great contest? Yeah, it was. I can't wait to hear the results. And before I bring up our dignitary who's going to give us some announcements, I just want to throw my fellow Fox Valley members under the bus. <coughs> I have two of them here making faces at me. I don't know what it means. But it does bring gravity and laughter and lightheartedness to what seems like a serious contest. So please feel free to relax and enjoy. There's no perfect way to have a contest. We're going to have a break, but before we have a break, I would like, and while the ballots are being counted, I would like to bring up the, what I call the River of Inspiration. The, tell me the new title again. Program Quality, Program quality Director for some reason. It is just not drilled into my head yet. But our River of Inspiration, our Program Quality Director for District 9, please welcome me. Well, Acha. So I'm sensing that PQD thing hasn't sunk in yet with the program quality yeah. director. Not yet. That's okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. I always love coming to this area. The Area 1 has got some great talent, and I have the privilege to see it at every fall contest. I don't think I've missed a single fall contest in the last five years. But today I have the opportunity to be here and share with you some upcoming information. As all of you know, the winners of tonight's contest, both the humorous speech and the speech evaluation, are going to go on and then represent your area at the Northwest Division Fall Contest. Anybody know when that is? No. Of course you guys do. Who said it? <laughs> yes, because Sue is pointing inside your pamphlets right now. It is literally written on the inside, bottom right side of the page. It's going to be on Saturday, October 8th, and that is the Fall Division Contest. It will be held at Harper College starting at, Rose? 10, 10 o'clock, briefing at 9.30. Briefing at 9.30. So be there to represent <laughs> your winners. Whoever wins the humorous speech and the speech evaluation contest, they have a job to do. Their job is to represent you and the area at the division contest, and you have a job to do, to support them in their journey. Now, in addition to that, as, as many of you know, it's around this time of year that three things happen. Number one, the leaves start to change color. Number two, the temperature starts to fall. Number three, we all go pile into Walmart and Target and fill up on the, the Halloween candy. That's, that's my plan. It happens every year. But in addition to that, there is also the fall conference. And that is where the winners of Rose's contest, at the division fall contest, and all of the fall division contestants are going to take their A game and represent their, their skill sets at either the district fall contest, uh, the district humor speech contest, or the district evaluation contest. Now this year it's also a little bit different. But year after year, for many years, we've always had the fall conference be on one day. But today we're trying, this year we're trying something just a little bit different. We are actually having a day and a half. So we'll be having a Friday night and an all day Saturday. Now many of you are thinking, I don't know if I have the time to be, you know, attending a contest on two days. Well guess what? Friday is going to be really a day or an evening of acknowledgement. So if you've earned an, uh, an educational award or leadership award, if you have actually earned uh, anything, that's, that's the day that we're going to be recognizing you. So your membership allows you that opportunity to be highlighted on a district stage, and we have underwhelmed that in years past. This year we're bringing it to the forefront, so you will be treated not to runny eggs on a Saturday morning, but a nice, <laughs> hot, good, healthy dinner on behalf of the district. So Friday night... And then Saturday is when the whole shebang kicks off. So these are the dates that you'll need to know. Friday, October 28th, and Saturday, October 29th. It will be held at the Holiday Inn in Elk Grove Village. And we have our keynote speaker. That's actually at the back. Is that correct? Yay! So the information you may be thinking is, where is it? It's on the back of your pamphlet, or the back of your agenda. We have been honored and privileged to have the second vice president of our international organization flying in from, I believe, Chennai, India. His name is Deepak Menon. So he will be coming in and sharing his leadership lessons with our organization all day Saturday, twice. Once right at the warm opening ceremonies and once right after lunch. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to see. I know that my time is limited, but I will tell you that the registration and the website will be updated hopefully by the end of this week, and if not, by early next week. As always, you can reach out to any of your area directors. Everybody say hi to Joe. Joe, say hi. 
<laughs> Everyone knows Joan anyway. So you can reach out to Joan, you can reach out to Rose, your Northwest Division Director, or myself, or anyone who will be more than happy to share with you the details. But I do look forward to seeing you come to that conference. Again, year after year, we thank you for what you do in terms of your contributions and service and leadership to the district, and we want to acknowledge you as well. So thank you for your time. I'll turn this meeting back over to our contest host, Master, and the keeper. Just got you saying the word. All right, we're going to take a break. There's food back there. It is, let's go until 8.05. That will give us time to do the contest when we have four speakers. Please enjoy the food, and I encourage you to continue a tradition that we have in Area 1 for interacting club, from club to club. We are known for this. We have a long story history of knowing one another. So I would encourage you to find someone in this room you do not know, you know them, by 8 to 5.